Tonight, Haiti's prime minister pledges to step down as his country plunges into chaos. Law and order collapses. Gang violence runs rampant. And everyone who says to me, well, it couldn't get much worse than this, is say, still can. As Haitian Canadians fear for family. Soon there, there will be a lack of water and medication. The clash on Capitol Hill. U.S. lawmakers grill the man in charge of investigating Joe Biden's handling of classified documents. Also, the Boeing whistleblower who raised safety concerns found dead as new details emerge about that terrifying midair drop. The Canadian passenger who experienced the nightmare. I was sure it was over. Plus, back-to-back -back cyber attacks expose gaps in digital defenses of municipalities. And a deep sea discovery. Let's agree this is special and we should protect it. The coral conundrum off BC's central coast. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Good evening, everyone. Nearly 200,000 Haitian Canadians are helplessly watching their home country dragged into a downward spiral of political chaos and violence tonight. Today, Haiti's unelected prime minister, Ariel Henry, who's been leading the Caribbean nation since the 2021 assassination of its last president, pledged to step down as soon as a governing transitional council was created. Henri is widely blamed for some of the worst turmoil in Haiti's long and turbulent history. Gangs have overtaken the country, attacked police stations, looted ports, and organized jailbreaks, releasing thousands of inmates. They now control 80 percent of the capital, and Canadians who are trapped say the crisis is making it too dangerous to leave. CTV's Quebec Bureau Chief Genevieve Beauchemin on the growing desperation. A scramble for power has now taken hold on the chaotic streets of Haiti. The Paro Prince protesters demanded the international community back away and let Haitians decide. They cannot choose for us, he says. People who fought on the streets to take down Prime Minister Ariel Henry should decide. The embattled Prime Minister Henry announced he would step down yesterday, leaving the post he had held since 2021, since the former president's assassination. This in a late-night video address from exile. Haiti besoin la paix. He said the country needed peace and asked Haitians to remain calm while a transitional council and an interim prime minister are put in charge. That was just hours after a phone conversation between Henri and Canada's prime minister focusing on the need for fair elections. Foreign Affairs Minister Mélanie Joly issued a statement today saying Canada welcomed the news of a political agreement among Haitian stakeholders. You've got to establish order and stability uh, and then continue with the development process and, and move to elections. But a timeline for that is still very much up in the air. As heavily armed gangs tighten their grip on the country, Canada has warned citizens in Haiti to shelter in place. The major gun battles between the gangs and the airport and our hotel security, it was, it was not a good place to be. The threat of famine, water running out and an epidemic continues to rise. And Quebec's large Haitian diaspora is growing increasingly concerned about the situation on the ground. And people talking, you know, calling the family here and saying, please, please help us. So this is how we feel. Our heart in Haiti and our body in Canada. Leaders in Montreal called for the Canadian government to take on a leadership role, saying they don't trust a transitional government decided outside the country. We, we, we love our country and we love our family living in the country. So. We, we, you know, we, it's not affordable for us to, to lose hope. <laughs> a contingent of a thousand Kenyan police officers was to head to the country to help quell the violence. But that's on hold for now until a new government is in place. Omar. All right, Genevieve Beauchemin in Montreal tonight. Genevieve, thank you. 200 tons of desperately needed aid for Palestinians in Gaza finally set sail from Cyprus. A Spanish ship towing a barge packed with pallets of food left port this morning. Part of an effort by the U.S. and allies to open a maritime humanitarian corridor and bring relief to civilians, the U.N. warns, are on the brink of famine. 
In the corridors of power on Capitol Hill today, new focus on the U.S. president's handling of classified documents. The special counsel who headed the investigation into Joe Biden was grilled by lawmakers, defending his decision not to prosecute the president, despite finding he willfully retained classified materials. And he was forced to explain why he described Biden as a, quote, elderly man with a poor memory. CTV's Washington Bureau Chief Joy Malbin on the firestorm. Robert Herr on the hot seat defending his report, investigating President Joe Biden's handling of classified documents discovered in his home and office. The, the report is not an exon exoneration. That word does not appear in my report. In a five-hour interview with Biden, Herr cited repeated memory lapses, noting the president couldn't recall when he was vice president or the year his son Bo died. But he chose not to prosecute because jurors, he said, would see, quote, a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. Democrats accused her, a registered Republican, of playing politics. You understood when you made that decision, didn't you, Mr. Herr, that you would ignite a political firestorm with that language, didn't you? Politics played no part whatsoever in my investigative steps. You used your report to trash and smear President Biden. Mr. Chairman, trying to draw a contrast, Democrats played video of Donald Trump's memory slip-ups. And we did with Obama. We won an election that everyone said couldn't be won. I'm not cognitively. And Republicans showing Biden mixing up world leaders. The president of Mexico, Sisi, did not want to open up the gate to allow humanitarian material to get in. Republicans went after the special counsel, demanding to know why the president wasn't prosecuted. Joe Biden broke the law. Calling it a double standard, Trump faces 40 criminal charges for misleading investigators, hiding hundreds of classified documents in his Florida home, and enlisting others to destroy them. All I have to do when I'm caught taking home uh, classified materials to say, I I'm sorry, Mr. Herbert, but I'm getting old. My memory's not so great. Both parties tried to score political points in a presidential election year where voters say age and mental competence matters. Omar? All right, Joy, thank you. And the Biden administration pledged $300 million of military aid to Ukraine today as Kyiv launched long-range drone attacks against multiple targets deep inside Russia. The strikes damaged a major oil refinery. Also today, a Russian military plane went down with 15 people on board. No word, though, on whether the two incidents are connected. The Kremlin blames an engine fire. There is word tonight a former Boeing whistleblower who raised safety issues was found dead from an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. A coroner says John Barnett took his own life before his upcoming trial against the company. This is my uh, retirement plaque. He retired in 2017 after 30 years. The news comes as fresh details are emerging about that terrifying mid-air drop involving a Boeing plane. CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver with the Canadian passenger who experienced the cabin chaos. The Chilean-owned LATAM Airlines flight was nearing its final destination, Auckland, when it suddenly lost altitude. I was sure it was over. I was like, this is, it, it's, we're going, like, this is heading down. Canadian Brian Joe Cat was on the packed flight and says the drastic drop sent his seatmate flying. I'm looking at him fully outstretched with his back on the roof of the plane. And then he came crashing down to the floor. It was insane. I was like, I thought I was dreaming. The pilot of the Boeing 787-9 Dreamliner reportedly told passengers his gauges temporarily stopped working. It's the easiest thing to do is to point the finger at Boeing and say it must be your fault, but it may be totally unrelated to Boeing. But a series of incidents have production standards at Boeing under new scrutiny. Last week, this engine burst into flames. Days later, a wheel fell off during takeoff. And now U.S. authorities have launched a criminal investigation into January's Alaskan Airlines incident after it was determined critical bolts connecting the door to the cabin were left off. Do you feel like they're making safe airplanes right now? Right now with our oversight, we're certifying them as safe, yes. But a new FAA report on the production of 737 MAX jets viewed by the New York Times raises questions. Boeing reportedly failed 33 of 89 audits. Its partner agency, Spirit Aerosystems, failed another 7 of 13 audits. And in one case, investigators observed mechanics at Spirit using a hotel key card to check a door seal. Damning report for Boeing. It really shows that, you know, those things that they ought to be doing right 
They're still not doing right. In a memo to staff issued today, Boeing says it is starting weekly compliance checks and equipment audits at its 737 MAX factory in an effort to reduce quality issues. Dozens of those 737 MAX jets, Omar, are operated by Canadian Airlines. All right, Annie, thank you. A Texas police chief has resigned over his department's failure to confront a school shooter. Daniel Rodriguez was away on holiday during the massacre in Uvalde. His acting chief did not intervene for over an hour while a gunman murdered 21 kids and teachers. An investigation recently cleared officers of any wrongdoing in raging parents who are demanding accountability. A neighborhood in Pennsylvania was rocked by a massive explosion that destroyed a home and killed two people inside. The blast caught on surveillance video, sending debris flying above the tree line. Witnesses say they felt the force of shock waves from kilometers away. It sounded like a bomb went off. Everything was just in a rubble. First responders described complete devastation when they arrived. Only the foundation left behind. I'm on the scene. I got a house on the ground, completely on the ground. No cause has been pinpointed, but officials say a private gas well and propane tanks were discovered at the home. Quebec Today revealed a budget the province's finance minister says could result in the province's highest deficit ever. It's projected at $11 billion. No tax hikes, but the government is delaying its timeline on balancing the books. We're dealing with it. Uh, the, the Quebecers are dealing with it. The $158 billion budget is being blamed on a stagnant economy, a historic forest fire season, and wage increases for public sector workers. Overall, spending is still up, with the biggest focus on health care and education. For the second time in a little over two weeks, an Ontario municipality was struck by a cyber attack. The latest, the town of Huntsville in Ontario's Muskoka region, which shut down its municipal office after the breach. Tonight, new warnings for more stringent measures as hackers become more sophisticated and brazen, exposing critical gaps. CTV's Heather Wright reports. The doors at Huntsville's municipal office are locked for the second straight day, the latest Ontario municipality to be hit by a cyber attack. As a result, several services are offline as they try to determine the extent of the breach. We're hearing about municipalities getting attacked with cybercrime much more frequently. Last month, a ransomware attack disabled parts of the city of Hamilton's IT systems. Staff are processing online payments manually and accepting cash where possible. After more than two weeks, the city still doesn't have a timeline for when things might be restored. According to the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity, there were over 70,000 reported cybersecurity incidents last year, a 25% jump from the year before. Hospitals, libraries, liquor stores, all among those hit by ransomware. FinTrack, Canada's financial watchdog agency, has also been hit, with systems taken offline to protect data. Cyber criminals are going after two things here. They hope they get a ransom and a payout, but they, even if they don't, they're hoping that they can take that data and use it in future attacks or even sell it to other cyber criminals and generate revenue that way. Both Huntsville and Hamilton say they do not have evidence sensitive information was taken, but municipalities hold a trove of personal data, making them an alluring target to hackers. In February, Canada was among several countries that helped take down Lockbit, one of the world's largest ransomware gangs. But it hasn't taken long for other groups to emerge and adapt. It is clear that smaller municipalities may not have the same resources as a larger municipality. Regardless, it is important that the adequate investments be made. Municipalities are being urged to treat cybersecurity the same way they do emergency preparedness, with systems being tested regularly so any weaknesses are found and fixed before hackers can do any damage. Omar. All right, Heather, thanks. Another potential blow to the Canadian media landscape and local journalism to tell you about tonight. Atlantic Canada's largest newspaper company, which publishes four daily newspapers and 14 weekly publications in every Atlantic province except New Brunswick, is seeking protection from its creditors. CTV's Sarah Plowman on what's at stake. For about 150 years, readers in Halifax have turned to the Chronicle Herald. But the future of that newspaper and others, like the paper of record in Cape Breton, St. John's and Charlottetown, is now uncertain, as the company that owns them files for creditor protection. This is, I think, a blow to uh, maritime Atlantic Canadian 
local news. Court documents filed this week show the newspaper company Saltwire is more than $94 million in debt and owes $32 million to its largest lender, Fiera Private Debt. The debt firm accuses Saltwire of mismanagement, such as withholding employee pension funds to pay for operations, adding the creditor has lost faith in Saltwire senior management. This insolvency lawyer is watching the court process closely. I, I don't think I don't think that they're done. It seems like where both companies, uh, the Saltwire and the creditor, are looking to go through this arrangement process. Saltwire formed in 2017 when the Herald's owners bought up more than two dozen transcontinental newspapers in Atlantic Canada. It was sort of a Hail Mary pass, but you know it was clear to most people that they were doing this with money they didn't have. Uh, and a plan that they didn't have. Saltwire says seeking creditor protection is a strategic move to ensure its long-term sustainability, that the operations will continue as usual, and the company is committed to delivering high-quality journalism. Still, many are concerned. We're concerned about the potential loss of two of our newspapers here on Prince Edward Island. Saltwire and its largest creditor are scheduled to be in court in Nova Scotia tomorrow, to argue over who should be appointed to monitor the business's finances going forward. Omar. Sarah Plowman in Fredericton tonight. Sarah, thank you. Coming up. It's the most northern reef ever found in the Pacific Ocean. The underwater find stunning researchers. Plus old traditions woven into a new collaboration. A marine mystery is baffling scientists tonight. They say a coral reef that should not exist is thriving off BC's coast deep in the Pacific Ocean, the most northern known coral reef in the body of water. BC Bureau Chief Andrew Johnson on what led to the dazzling discovery and the efforts underway to protect it. 200 meters below the surface in one of the most beautiful places on Earth, a one-of-a-kind find. Right close to the coast, Hidden in this deep pocket uh, is a coral reef. Oh, shouldn't be there. But here it is, thriving in the Pacific Ocean, just off BC's Great Bear Rainforest. The entire thing is teeming with life, and that's because the reef, like a forest on land, creates home and food, shelter and nursery grounds for other animals. A scientific first spotted by a local First Nation who tipped off Fisheries and Oceans Canada. In a lot of cases, science is just catching up to what we've been aware of for a long time. The world's most famous coral reefs are found in tropical waters, but the issue in the Pacific off BC isn't temperature, it's acidity. The coral shouldn't be able to form here. It's the most northern reef ever found in the Pacific Ocean. Now, after a team mapped the reef with a remote-controlled sub, Fisheries and Oceans Canada has closed the area to fishing that could damage the ecosystem. When you have a beautiful coral reef like this, it's not hard to get people to the table and say, you know, let's agree this is special and we should protect it. A team effort by scientists and First Nations who work together along this coast often. For the most part, uh, Western science and nation science has, you know, the same objectives. Another very unusual coral reef was actually discovered off Atlantic Canada, but it had already been destroyed. Scientists believe likely by fishing gear. Just the scenario they're hoping to avoid here in BC. Omar. What a fascinating find, Andrew. Thank you for this tonight. Still ahead, remembering an iconic hit maker. But when I dial the telephone, nobody's home. New information tonight about why a Canadian curling star was disqualified from last month's Scotties. It was for a doping violation. Four-time women's champion Brianne Harris tested positive for a banned drug used for muscle growth. Her lawyer says Harris was unknowingly exposed to it and wants to clear her name. She has been provisionally suspended. 
Four astronauts just back from the International Space Station are readjusting to gravity tonight. Main chute descent rate nominal. New capsules splashed down in the Gulf of Mexico early this morning. The multinational crew from the U.S., Japan, Denmark and Russia spent seven months in orbit. A sad note from the world of music tonight. Eric Carmen, the voice behind some of the best known power ballads, has died. The smash hit Hungry Eyes from the film Dirty Dancing defined the career of the soft rock crooner as a solo performer. But long before that, the prolific artist was the front man for the band Raspberries. He wrote and sang a track that Celine Dion later turned into a chart topper. His wife Amy said the Ohio-born artist died in his sleep, adding his music touched many and will be his lasting legacy. Carmen was 74. After the break. My mom to see like my work on Netflix on the number one show in the world right now, it, she's over the moon. A cherished craft finds a whole new audience. A treasured family tradition passed down through generations is now etched on the remake of a popular animated series on Netflix. The creative craft work by a Labrador artist who grew up watching the show is inspired by authentic indigenous works. Here's CTV's Garrett Berry. What started as family tradition. My mom learned it from my grandma and she was beating ever since she could pick up a needle and it's the same with me. Has now been woven into a popular TV hit. So for my mom to see like my work on Netflix on the number one show in the world right now, it she's over the moon. It all started with a surprise message on her small Etsy store. Haley Edmund Shawak then made some earrings and scarves the future. featured on one of the biggest TV shows of the year. My partner was just as excited and all of my family won't stop talking about it and everyone's just been really excited. They are worn by the Water Tribe in Avatar, The Last Airbender. The group in the show is inspired by Inuit culture. Even though it is a fantasy and you have to kind of build and commend that those two relationships of like the fantasy and the reality together, it still wanted to be respectful and accurate. Costume designer Farnaz Kaki Sadiq commissioned work from Indigenous artists across the country. I've learned so much from all of them. Uh, I've felt so fortunate to be able to work with them and collaborate with them to bring in their work. And I've always loved showcasing upcoming and new newcomers and new talent all the time. Growing up, I would see like all the Native costumes and it would not sit right with me, but seeing them put in like the research and the love and appreciation for everything for the show, it really touched home to me. Season one drew almost 20 million views in its first week, and Netflix has announced seasons two and three are in progress. I know about the show and there's not much about the Northern Water Tribe later on, but I, I have a little bit of hope. That might mean a few more opportunities for a part-time Labrador artist to shine. Gary Berry, CTV News, St. John's. Beautiful work. That's a snapshot of this Tuesday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. Good night and see you tomorrow.